right, let's go ahead and fire it up. Got lots of good things to talk about today. So let me uh, let me pray for us. Our gracious heavenly Father, thank you for the um, opportunity to gather on a, on a gorgeous uh, fall morning. And we pray that uh, as we continue to look at the, the activities uh, of your people here, the, the, the movements that came about, the different theological, uh, even the controversies, which were painful at the time, um, but, but still ended up strengthening many of your churches, while others, sadly, um, you know, uh, went off the rails, if you will. Uh, but even in the long run, it, it's uh, it has helped to shape us and to help us better know who we are in Christ. And Lord, as we uh, turn very much so to our specific heritage today uh, in, in the, the context of Puritanism, we pray that you would give us insight into who these people uh, were, um, what they were about, what are some stereotypes that people have that uh, are just not true, what are some uh, stereotypes people have that are true, that we want to... to Make sure that we don't um, uh, embody. Uh, help us to understand all of these things. Have a good conversation and uh, grow in Christ. In whose name I pray. Amen. All right. So, uh, little uh, little recap for us here. If you remember, um, last week during the intro, he um, he really, Dr. Nichols on the video set the the course for us with this tale of two paths. Uh, which he, he really is just borrowing from Augustine's City of God, where you have the City of God and the City of Man. Uh, the City of Man is this worldly order. That's what he would have called it. And for Augustine, that would have been embodied uh, in Rome. Rome was collapsing. Rome was collapsing when, when Augustine writes this. And it, 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 I mean, just put yourself in his shoes by thinking, what if, you know, political comments, keep to yourself for now, uh, but what if America was was falling apart, like like actually, versus maybe some chicken little stuff, the sky is falling, but what if, what if this is it, right? Um, you know, there's signs of invasion, we are losing territory, you know, I mean, this this is it. it, it we agree, there, there'd be a, a grieving process going on, as well as a what on earth is happening, what's gonna happen to us, et cetera, et cetera. Well, he's going through that, Augustine, but it causes him to go back and say, all right, where's my first allegiance? I, am a, I may love my nation or my empire or whatever it is, uh, but first and foremost, I am a child and a citizen of the kingdom of God, uh, the city of God. But I'm also, uh, like it or not, a citizen of the city of man while I'm here. And so um, to what extent do the two go together, city of God and city of man, the ethics of the two? Uh, to what extent are they polar opposites? So that's going to be the, the tale of two paths. Where can we intersect with culture and society without compromising the gospel? Um, which leads him to talk about these two paths that, that then come out of it, cultural accommodation and confessional affirmation. So cultural accommodation is trying to find out where we can fit, but then unfortunately we start little by little to give up the ground of the gospel in order to be seen as um, um, cool, hip, uh, acceptable, palatable, whatever you want to say, uh, where we end up being guided by uh, culture rather than the word of God. Confessional affirmation um, is to confess and profess the central teachings of the word of God. Um, that may be through the use of the actual creeds and confessions that then come in uh, through later history, but it doesn't have to be through that. It is more confessing with our lives and our mouths um, that the, the Word of God is central, the convictions um, uh, that, that the Spirit lays upon our heart take root, um, and we are, I, I think there's a, a, a real... How do I say this? There's a real danger in, for all of us, every generation, becoming um, or accommodating to the culture wholesale. That's a danger for any church, and we're going to see that in a few weeks with liberalism coming up. 
I wish that I could say I'm 100% in this camp. I want to be. But my, all I'm saying is my sin doesn't allow me. Um, you know, I, I find myself here. I don't want to be here. It's like Paul at the end of Romans 7. I don't want to be here. <laughs> I want to be here. Um, but I, I can't lie to you and say, oh, I always get it right. Or the church always gets it right. Uh, I wish that we could, but we don't this side of glory. And so that's where we have to say, where are we failing? Let's repent. Let's hear the good news. And let's move forward. So he's just going to trace these themes out as we go through each, um, uh, each movement now. And if you remember... He, um, he does talk about, I'm just going to look at this first bullet point, and we're going to look at them today. The group that held sway over Christian identity in the early colonial uh, period, very clearly the Puritans. Who else, what other groups were here on the shores of North America um, at the time of the Puritans, even a little before the Puritans? There were other Christian groups here, though. You had the Roman Catholics through the through the Spanish, right down in down in Florida in particular, and then they will come over to Maryland. They will come over to Maryland. Virginia and Anglican or Virginia? Anglican. Anglican. Yep. So the whole Virginia area is Anglican. Um, Church of England, and uh, and so, um, uh, but but here in in the colonies, it's going to be uh, Pilgrims and Puritans. Um, and, and there's a, a slight distinction between the two, uh, which he'll, he'll talk about and then I'll talk about. Um, highly congregationalist, highly Calvinistic. And they are, um, as he said last week, they're going to suck the oxygen out of the, of the room when you think of talking about early Christian history. They just, to this day, you don't see TV shows made or movies or plays written about the Spaniards down in, you know, Augustine, Florida, or Augustine, Florida, however you pronounce it down there. Uh, you don't see too many movies that I'm aware of talking about uh, Jamestown and, and the Anglicans there. Uh, but you are going to have um, some stereotypes. Uh, first of all, you've got the Crucible, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but then you have Handmaid's Tale. You have all sorts of stuff that will play on the puritanical nature uh, of, uh, of American society. And they're just they're talking about the Puritans uh, when they use that terminology. So the last thing before we, we uh, turn to the video, American Christianity is primarily, um, I won't say exclusively, but primarily rooted in the Protestant Reformation. Certainly early Christianity. Um, um, or, or, or early history. When you start to see mass migration coming, especially with the, the Irish from, um, or the Irish coming over, uh, you know, potato famine type stuff, you're going to, to have Catholicism come with them, and you'll have it come with some other groups. But the groups that came here, even Anglicanism, is going to be rooted in the Protestant Reformation. And so that's going to dominate much of uh, American Christianity. Um, up, I, I'd say even to the present day, uh, but Catholicism has certainly has certainly grown there. Um, Daniel, I have a question. Were the yep. Congregationalists or uh, not Congregationalists, uh, Anglicans or Church of England? Yep. Anonymous, right? Sort of. Yes. Thing? Yep. Were they sympathetic towards the uh, Reformation at that time in history? They they were. Um, they were. Um, now at, at times you can. Um, at times they seem to be trying to live in two camps, right? Um, but uh, but certainly at that time, with, with even before that, with the likes of the Thomas Cranmer, there's some of these early names in there, um, very much so. You would have had, there, there would be some theological distinctions. I mean, I can't speak for you, but I, I'm not an Anglican for certain reasons, but I wouldn't call them Catholic, and I wouldn't have called Cranmer Catholic. Um, and, um, and the Christianity Explored uh, evangelistic series that we use, the, here, the guy Rico Tice who runs it, he's, a, he's an Anglican priest um, because he was at John Stott's church. John Stott was kind of the evangelical statement, or statesman, who was an Anglican. So 
Uh, and there's been a movement of late at, at my alma mater, at Gordon-Conwell, where even somebody like a, a, a Ray Pendleton, who was this, uh, he, you know, the head of the counseling department, died in the wool Baptist, very kind, very nice. He's Anglican now, right? And there was, there was a shift towards that. And I'm like, how do you go from Baptist to Anglican? Uh, that is, did you do that? Yeah. Oh, I don't see your collar. I, that's why I was confused. Yeah. <laughs> interesting just point of fact the Anglican Church now yeah. wants to be closely more closely aligned with the reformed yeah they're out of African diocese the African diocese so if you look at Episcop and, and Episcopalianism is, Amer is the American or North American version of Anglicanism okay. right so if you look at the Episcopalian churches today by and large they're going to be very liberal not all of them You'll get pockets where it's like, hey, there's a Bible believing. Okay, only one, you know, that type of thing. Um, but you'll have some that will call themselves Anglican or they're Episcopalian and they're like, I just can't be in the Episcopalian denomination anymore. And they end up migrating under the, the authority of the African diocese um, because the Africans tend to be much more orthodox and conservative theologically. <laughs> And so now you have American churches under the oversight of African denominations. And I have a couple buddies who are Anglican priests who move their churches that way. And I think, hey, God bless you. You know, more power to you. Um, so last thing, last thing is um, if you remember, and I think, yep, Philip Schaff, this top bulletin, or bullet. Um, 18, now this is 1844, but it's, it's, it's us. Every theological vagabond, every peddler comes here to drive his trade without passport or license and sell his false wear at pleasure. What is to come of such confusion is not now to be seen. So it, it's the idea that America is the land of plenty, it's the land of ideas, and that's a, that's a very good thing. It's the land of free speech from early on, that's a very good thing. Um, but it's also the land where we, we don't have, we don't like authority. We just by nature, I'd say as humans, we don't like authority because we tried to throw off God's authority. Um, but, but add to that our culture, the American culture is one where we really don't like authority. Um, in theory, and, I, and I, I love our system of government, in theory we have checks and balance. And if one of the three branches of our government takes on too much power, uh, which we've seen from time to time and are seeing of late, uh, at least the tendency to push that way, uh, that should make us nervous, right? So, um, but because we don't like authority, that does open the door for all sorts of ideas to come in here and take root. And um, I'm glad we don't have a national church. I really am. I'm not pushing for that. But one of the, you know, uh, consequences of that is now anybody can come in and start to, to peddle their, their stuff, right? Um, now, I really am gonna come back to this in a few weeks when we get to that time period, because that's the second great awakening, and <laughs> that's where you're really gonna see the context of this statement, and you're gonna see this really play itself out. But for now, let's watch the video and then spend our time discussing the period. Well, we were talking about the roots of American Christianity, and one of those roots, of course, is the New England Puritans. So I want to spend this time with you talking about the Puritans. Who were the Puritans? Now, as we get into this, we have to deal with, first, what are the perceptions of the Puritans, especially in American culture. Where we are right now, where we find ourselves, our understanding of the Puritans largely comes to us mediated through a few things. Uh, one of them, and you might have you might recall reading this uh, back in a high school literature class or in a college literature class, is Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. And of course, as you read that story, you come across this notion that the Puritans are self-righteous hypocrites, right? Uh, the hero of the story is the one who is ostracized from the Puritan community the one who's marginalized and doesn't fit in. And the scarlet letter A, which was a symbol of shame, ends up evolving into this uh, almost trophy 
as Hawthorne unfolds his novel. The other thing we learn about the Puritans is through a play uh, written by Arthur Miller. And it came from a context, it, it came from a context of the McCarthy era purges. And so he looked back to another moment in American history where the term witch hunt actually originated. And so he takes us back to Salem. Salem and the Salem Witch Trials of 1692-1693. And of course, same theme comes out of that. These are self-righteous hypocrites who actually burned people uh, who were dissenters and didn't agree with them. So much of what we understand of Puritans in popular American culture is mediated through these things. Uh, there was the, the famous H.L. Mencken, uh, the reporter at the Baltimore Sun, and, and just an American cultural commentator, very curmudgeonly, Mencken. And Mencken had this great quote about the Puritans. He said that a Puritan is anyone who thinks that somewhere, someone might just be having a good time. Uh, that's a Puritan, right? And we even have this expression, puritanical, right? That's not a compliment. Uh, that's someone who's stuffy and someone who's rigid and, and someone who has applied these strict rules to themselves. Well, can we just blow all those stereotypes out of the water? Uh, this is not true of puritanism. So let's first look at what Puritanism is, and then let's look at a few key Puritans, just to get a handle on some of them and get to know some of them. Well, the first thing as we come into what Puritanism is, is a set of beliefs, but not just beliefs. These are really convictions. You know, we're talking about confessional affirmation and conviction. These are convictions that get played out in how the Puritans live. And at the top of the list is the Puritans were God-centered. It was a view of the sovereignty of God. It was a view of the holiness of God. It was a view of the transcendence of God. Uh, these Puritans, we're going to see this in a little bit, they're, they're not anti-education, they're not anti-learning. Uh, the Puritans were all, many of them, before they came to New England, were Cambridge trained and Oxford trained. And they were trained in classical education, and they were classical theists. They had at the center of their worldview a high view of who God is. And that also played out into their worship of God, which is very central for them. In fact, for the Puritan, all of life is to be lived in the worship of who God is. So, we start with God, that takes us to worship. The other thing we find with the Puritans is they were people of the book. The Bible was very much a part of Puritan culture and the Puritan mind. You go back to the New England primer, you know, the, the learning of the alphabet, and I, I don't know if you know what the B is, but the B is B, heaven to find, the Bible mind. In other words, this is to be your guide, this is the authority for your life. The Puritans were people of the book. Uh, you see this even at the center of their worship at the center of their church architecture. Uh, this, as you walk into some of these New England meeting houses, and sometimes, mostly they were rectangles, sometimes they were squares, but as you walked into the building, they were very plain, uh, not, not like the Anglicans or not like, like the Lutherans. Uh, they were very plain, tend to have plain glass windows, plain pews, but immediately your eyes were drawn to the pulpit. It was always prominent. It was always displayed off the ground. Sometimes you had to literally climb a ladder to get up into it. And if, if you've ever read Moby Dick, you know there's that great story before they head out to sea, they go to church, and that church, the pulpit, was the mast of a ship, 
and he climbed a rope ladder to get up into the pulpit. And then once he was in the pulpit, he brought the ladder up with him. Right? He was stuck there until he was done. But the idea of the pulpit was, was twofold. One was a practical reason. This is, this is before microphones, and you had sound systems. And some of these churches are pretty large. And this is also an era before hearing aids. And some of these congregants were maybe on the elderly side and couldn't quite hear as well as they once did. And so the pulpit being lifted up and the pastor being literally over the congregation would allow for the pastor's voice to carry out over the congregation. It was an acoustic purpose, but that was only secondary. Uh, the main reason was the symbolism that we come to church to sit under the authority of the preached word. The sermon was like a blood sport for the Puritans. It was, it was the highlight of their week, the sermon. And it was a tour de force, training in the word of God, sitting under the authority of God. So you begin to look at a Puritan worldview, it was God-centered, because it was God-centered, it's going to focus on worship, and not just the, the community worship on the Lord's Day, but all of life as an act of worship. And of course, there are going to be people of the book. The other thing that you find about the Puritans is they were Calvinists. Of course they were Calvinists, uh, because they have a high view of God. But they're going to follow through on all of these doctrines. They're going to affirm the doctrine of original sin. Go back to the New England primer. B is heaven to find, the Bible mind. You might have heard the, the one for A. And the jingle for A is in Adam's fall, we sin all. And so they start off with this notion of total depravity. That we are unregenerate that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And if that's the case, then salvation, how we come to faith in Christ, is exclusively, only, solely the work of God. Uh, we call this... Monergism. And monergism literally means work of one. And here we're talking about the work of God. This is going to be very important because it's this Calvinism that is the theology that dominates and undergirds the first great awakening. And if that's the case, then that's going to make its way through the preaching. It's going to make its way through and the converted understanding of what is happening at conversion. As we move into the Second Great Awakening, we're going to see a shift away from Calvinism. In fact, on some of the major figures of the Second Great Awakening, we're going to see a flat-out rejection of Calvinism. And so the opposite of monergism is synergism, S-Y-N, or that's the Greek. Uh, we could go to the Latin, co-opera. Now, I always love this because this to me is the great definition of opera. It takes work to listen to an opera. So I know my buddy, Dr. Derek Thomas, is spinning around right now that I just said that. But opera means work. And co means together. So our salvation is a cooperative endeavor between us and God. In fact, you'll even come to hear revival preachers say things like, God is waiting on you. God is waiting on you. What are you going to do? We'll fast forward a little bit because I, I just have to because I find it exciting. But we'll fast forward a little bit. There's a, there was a track that was put out by Billy Sunday. And it was like a ballot that you would vote. And it had three columns. God, the devil, and you. And then it had two columns on the side. For and against. And God has voted. And do you know how God has voted? He's voted for you. 
So God's for you. But the devil voted. And guess what the devil voted? He's against you. So God's for you. Satan is against you. That's a tie. Then the final column with you, it's a question mark. It's now up to you. You cast the deciding vote. Okay. So let's go back to Puritanism. Let's think this through. This is not just an affirmation of doctrine. It impacts how we understand salvation and how we enter into the Christian life and has everything to do with how we live the Christian life. Right? So these were Calvinists. And because they were Calvinists, salvation is the work of God alone. Right? Now, one last is, and I'm writing downhill now, but it is the covenant. Now, this is very key. The covenant structures all of the relationships within the Puritan world. First, the covenant structures our relationship to God. This is what we see in the Old Testament. God enters into a covenant with his people. In fact, we see it dramatically and vividly portrayed. And as you go through the Old Testament, what do the prophets do as they come on to the scene? They remind Israel that they are God's covenant people. They remind Israel that God has been faithful to the covenant. He redeemed you from your slavery in Egypt. He brought you out of that land, and he brought you into the promised land. He's given you everything you need. He's brought you into this land of milk and honey. God has never, ever broken covenant or failed you. But what have you done? Even an ox knows its owner. Even a donkey knows its owner. But my people don't know my name. Right? So they've broken covenant. So this is very important to the Puritans, this notion of covenant that governs first and foremost our relationship to God. But then that covenant moves out to the human relationships that we have. So in the family, there is a covenant bond. There is a covenant between father and children, and children and parents. There's a covenant between husband and wife, and they spoke of marriage as a marriage covenant that would be entered into. So the covenant dominated the family, but moving out, the covenant also dominated the church. And sometimes Puritans would even use that language of church membership. They would speak of you signing a church covenant. And just as covenant relationships have blessings when there is obedience and curses or judgments when there is disobedience, so it is with this covenant in the church. So the, the pastors of a church covenant to nurture you and to bring you up, right, in the admonition of the Lord and to provide for you nourishment of the sermon and the Lord's Supper. And what do you covenant with the church? You covenant obedience. And so one of the things that the Puritans took very seriously, and they got this from, from John Knox and the Scottish Reformation branch, is church discipline. And this becomes, this is, this is the scarlet letter. Uh, this becomes one of those things that is used to, to sort of pillory the Puritans and to make fun of them and to deride them. And we all think of the town stocks, right, as representative of the Puritan town. Well, not only does the covenant govern our relationship with God in the family, in the church, it also governs our relationship with one another in the society. And so you see this in the pilgrims, right, even while they're still out on the boat before they land, on New England soil, it's the Mayflower Compact. That was a covenant that they would obey the authorities and the authorities would set up structures to protect them and provide for them. And if they disobeyed the authorities, right, punishment would set in. Uh, they even spoke of themselves, and John Winthrop does this on board the Arbella. And, and we'll talk about Winthrop in a moment, but Winthrop was not a minister. He was actually a lawyer, ends up being a politician, ends up being the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But it is Winthrop that preaches the sermon 
on board the Arbella before they land. And it's in that sermon, titled A Model of Christian Charity, that he gives that phrase, a city upon a hill. But it's also in that sermon that Winthrop says what we are establishing here is a Bible commonwealth. And that is a covenant that this, these, these colonists of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which will evolve to become the colony of Massachusetts, it's a covenant with one another. So the covenant governs all relationships. And here's the thing about Puritanism. Uh, Puritanism functions best as a whole system. It's almost like an either-or thing. Puritanism is not really something that can sort of be halfway. It sort of either is or it isn't. And what you see is within a few generations, Puritanism becomes isn't, right? And, and Edwards is even feeling it in his own congregation in the 1720s and the 1730s. He's feeling himself to be a Puritan. All of this marks Jonathan Edwards. He's, he's the God-centered theologian of God-centered theologians, Jonathan Edwards. But his congregation is no longer Puritan. They've moved away from this. And they moved away from these things governing their lives. But if we go back to that original generation and the second generation, we see this as marking Puritanism. Well, in addition to the covenant, I want to say one more thing, because we forget this sometimes. I think I've got room here. Uh, and that is, they are people of two books. There are people of the Bible. There are people of the book. But they are also people of the book of nature. And they use that as a gateway to not, not hide from learning, but to run into learning. One of the first things they do in Massachusetts when they get here, after they uh, have a governor, and after they you know, build a home, and after they plant some corn, they found Harvard University. They were all about education. Uh, most of the Puritan leaders who landed on the Arbella had degrees from Emmanuel College and Trinity College in Cambridge. And one of the things they made their students at Harvard do was write original poetry. And if you wanted to write it in Latin, so be it. They loved learning. They loved exploring. We're going to talk about cotton mather and increased mather. Th these were scientists in addition to being ministers. And so we forget that sometimes about the Puritans. That these Puritans were not just about exploring God's word. They were about exploring God's world. And they loved learning. And they loved learning about God's world. So let me just talk about a few of the key Puritans and just give you some, uh, a little bit of uh, texture to some of the Puritans. One of them is John Winthrop, the one we mentioned. Winthrop is the one who saw colonial New England as a Bible commonwealth. I'll give you his dates. He was born in 1588 in Old England, of course, and dies in 1649. I do find it interesting that he's not a minister, but he's the one preaching and giving the sermon to sort of launch this vision as they leave the Arbella and begin the settlement at New England. Another stalwart Puritan was Cotton Mather. Mather was born in 1663, and he died in 1728. Uh, Mather is New England royalty. His maternal grandfather was John Cotton, who was one of those early Puritans, First Church Boston, and his father was Increase Mather. And Cotton Mather uh, wrote one of the first, this is why I like to talk about him, he wrote the first church history, American church history book ever written. It was called Magnalia Americana Christi, The Great Works of Christ in America. And it was his way of chronicling 
these events, of seeing that this is really the work of God and bringing the Puritans there and establishing them. But he went on to write on all subjects. He wrote on medicine. He wrote on science. He wrote on astronomy. He wrote on hermeneutics. He wrote on theology. He is, to me, that consummate Puritan whose mind just explores every nook and cranny, turns over every stone in the stream. And honestly, I think it goes back to the focus on worship and the God-centered. Do you remember what Isaac Newton said, right? He, he studied science and studied how the world works so that he would have an even grander vision of the greatness of God and the creation that he gave us. And that was Cotton Mather. Oh, one of my favorite Puritans is the Puritan poet Anne Bradstreet. She was born in 1612, Old England, came to New England on board the Arbella in 1630. She dies in 1672. Both her father and her husband were governors of Massachusetts, but she was America's first poet. Her book of poetry was published in 1650, The Tenth Muse. And what you find, and I totally commend to you the poetry of Anne Bradstreet, what you find in the poetry of Anne Bradstreet is applied Puritanism. She's writing poems on the death of her children. She's writing poems when her house burns down. And in all of those, you see her resting in the sovereignty of God. It's beautiful, applied, Puritan theology, the poet Anne Bradstreet. And then one final Puritan to mention. This is the Apostle to the Indians, as he was uh, called. This is John Eliot. He was born in 1604. He died in 1690. He translated the Westminster Shorter and Larger Catechism into Algonquin. And then in 1661, translated the New Testament, and in 1663, he translated the Old Testament into Algonquin. They were published together, and it was the first Bible published in America, the Algonquin Bible, through the efforts of John Eliot. In fact, if you were to ask John Eliot, he would tell you that the Puritans were brought here all the way across the Atlantic and if I remember right, I think the Arabella traveled at a whopping two miles per hour. So here we're going across the Atlantic Ocean at two miles per hour. Hold on to your seatbelt, right? All of this to bring the gospel to the natives uh, that were here in the Algonquins. So those are some of the Puritans. Next episode, sadly, we're going to look at the decline of Puritanism and what went wrong. So we'll pick it up next time together. <coughs>
painted white. It's going to be very plain looking, even though we do have the, the Chunk Loy painting in there that fools the eye, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the original meeting houses that they had, because what's that? That's our fourth building, right, on the premises? Right. Um, the original first couple were just log cabins, basically, but, you know, based on the readings, they were just kind of little cut down a tree and build a house, and that's what you got, right? Um, but that's all you needed. And so, um, though this is a, a certainly an improvement upon that, um, it, it's not, I think it's gorgeous, but it's gorgeous as an example of New England congregational architecture. Um, it's, it's not going to wow you like uh, the, the great cathedrals of this world, right? And because it's not meant to do that. But um, uh, when you come in, you, like you said, you come down that center aisle and you're going to see, ba bam, the, um, the pulpit up there. And you alluded to it with your reference to the book that was there. Why is it so high? He gave you two reasons. Acoustics. Acoustics, right? And even with microphones, we're still not the best with it. So acoustics, but well, that's secondary, but it's important. And why else? Concept of elevating the word. Concept of elevating the word. And if the word is elevated, where do you sit? Lord. You sit under. Where is the authority though? Exactly. Um, is 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 the idea? That's the symbolism of it. And um, and and so you will have. Um, I'll go back to to my previous church. They went through. Now that there's a manual, uh, it used to be a manual Baptist church, now it's just a manual church, it's congregational. But they apparently once upon a time had a higher uh, dais, you know, it, it was, the current one is not three, it's probably two, you know, put it here, put the stage here. The former one I think was probably here, based on what they told me, right? So not super high, but high enough. And uh, and it had it, it had a pulpit, and when I came, there, there was a pulpit, but it was kind of a movable, more of a lectern uh, like that. And I ended up, um, I just, because we had a, a band, that just aesthetically, that didn't, it just looked goofy, right? You had drums and guitars and bass, you know, guitar and all that type of stuff. And then this kind of ancient looking lectern. Um, so I, I just, I got rid of that and I had this, or I actually had a stand for my iPad. Um, and the church had long had its worship wars, so that wasn't a big deal when I came in. Thankfully, I didn't have to go through it. Um, but you will still hear talks today, and I understand it, you know, where they could cry. Now, in a class, they wouldn't mind me using this. But preaching from this, it's not so much that this devalues or somehow actually has power to devalue the Word of God. But why do you think people... Who are 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 still more um, maybe highly Calvinistic? You get what are called hyper Calvinists because they drink too much coffee. No, because they it's their view. Um, it's a high view of Calvinism, and then you just kind of get the rest of us that are Calvinists. But some of your hyper Calvinists or more stodgy Calvinists, uh, boy, if I preach from this, uh, don't do that. Why? Why would they be so upset at this? This music sample. Right. It, it doesn't say authority. It doesn't, it, 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 it's not big, it doesn't elevate, not so much me, but me in my office as expositor of the word. And I, and I get that. I mean, I get what they're saying. I, I, I'm not going to die on the hill. I've obviously already told you that I'm, I'm okay preaching from something like this, because I still think it's the word going forth. But I get what they're saying. Um, yeah, I'm just not willing to, to engage in that fight. Uh, but you're going to have that over there. What are some other aspects of the Puritans? Um, go through that list, and let's talk about that, 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 the six parts of it. What was the first one? God-centered. They're God-centered. Uh, what was the second? Worship. Yep. Let's keep going down the list. You have your list there? Bible. Yep. Covenant. Covenant. Calvinists, Calvinist. yeah, Calvinist covenant, and then um, uh, there was a the, the subset that we'll get to under Calvinists. You know, 
um, well, let's just say it. Because they were Calvinists, they believed salvation um, was accomplished monergistically, right? Meaning, uh, ergos is the word for work, uh, mono, one. Uh, so the work of one alone, that one being God. Versus synergism, cooperating with, right? Um, and so that's going to dominate the early teachings. And then what's this, this last one they talked about? Yeah, love of learning because they're the people of two books, right? Have you ever heard that term, people of two books? No? Um, it's, it, it, it is out there. I mean, I, I, I referenced it, but it's, it's because I like studying the Puritans and kind of was immersed in that. Um, uh, I would call myself a modern-day Puritan. In fact, Terry Shanahan, our, our, he's now our retired regional minister, uh, our new one is just as wonderful, a guy named Paul McPeters. Uh, but, um, and Paul is a uh, Calvinist, Paul's reformed, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but Terry himself um, used to say, uh, when people ask about the four C's, our denomination, he's, he emphasized a couple things. Yes, Congregationalists, but it's the first C, that we are conservative Congregationalists. And then he explains what that is, conservative theologically, and et cetera, et cetera. But he says, um, we didn't, our history, we're not that old as a denomination, it's just the 60s, right? But we're not a break off of a denomination. We didn't split from a more liberal, like the UCCs or something like that. We were founded as the four C's. And he said, the best way I try to explain it, I'll say it because the word will, will kind of um, resonate with people, then I have to unpack some things. We are, in many ways, uh, cut from the cloth of New England Puritanism. We are the modern-day New England Puritans. Then the stereotypes come up on Puritans, but at least they know the term. And so then you can go in there and start to unpack what that is. But in terms of those six, that is going to be, by and large, the four C's. Um, you'll, get, you'll get some flexibility um, on the Calvinistic side of things because each church um, you know, can, can take its approach to that. Uh, but by and large, it's going to be reformed and, um, um, and, and down through it. But that, that um, people of two books thing, the, the idea, in fact, where, where, would that, where would that come from biblically? Where would you get the justification to call nature the book of nature? They're primarily going to pull from a New Testament text. There are going to be several texts in the Old Testament. But there's one in particular um, that uh, leaves all humans, hint, hint, without excuse. Romans. It's Romans. It's Romans 1. It's the whole idea that nature itself, God's created order, declares his glory uh, so that we are without excuse. Our fault is we suppress the truth and unrighteousness, says Paul. And so... Um, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but um, it, it, it's actually incorrect. Now, hear, hear the full statement of what I'm saying. It's incorrect to say um, a lack of belief in Christ is why you're not saved. The reason that's incorrect is that's actually not why you're not saved. I mean, it is, but the real reason why you're not saved is because we have suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. We are created to know God. Paul says we haven't done that. We've suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. The only way to now be saved from that eternal error is through Christ. So yes, you do need to believe in Christ. But technically, that's not what makes us damned. It's suppressing the truth of God in our unrighteousness, according to Romans 1. The only remedy is Jesus Christ. Would you say that, you know, not, I don't know, Darwin, I'll throw him out, but there were many uh, men before him, yeah. I don't know how many decades or centuries or whatever, because uh, they were looking at the same creation they were. Uh, that we were looking at. Yeah. But could it be that it wasn't what they were looking at at creation, rather than it was a moral issue in their individual lives, they wanted to justify their lifestyle, whatever they were thinking of that worldview morally, and then therefore, let's get rid of God and, and you know, through their interpretation of creation. Yeah, I, I, I think um, 
I, I, I wouldn't doubt that in some cases. I mean, I, I would be, I want to be careful to say that um, because people were living immorally or apart from God, therefore they ended up becoming, you know, um, um, humanistic or Darwinistic, you know what I mean, in terms of uh, their views. Um, but I do, here's where I would agree, what, what is happening, regardless of how they're behaving, your eyes are either open to the gospel or they're not. Now, here's where my Calvinism comes out. By the sovereign work of God or not. He's either opened your eyes or, or not. Or your heart has been repl replaced, the heart of stone's been replaced with a heart of flesh, or it hasn't, right? And so um, you are either going to be open to God or not, but even then, you're going to get Christians, well-meaning Christians, you know, who are going to disagree scientifically, say, about the age of the earth. Because what they're doing now is saying, all right, here's, here's what we think scripture says, but here's what we also think science is saying, and the two won't contradict. So, you know, it, six days, for example. And if, if that's the case, then, you know, you'll get some that say not only six days, but, you know, the, the earth is 6,000 plus years old. Um, and they're going to say the Bible says it because it says day. But then you'll get other ones that say the Bible says yom, not day. Yom can mean two or three things in Hebrew, right? And so uh, not just that, but when you look at the Bible covenantally in its ancient Near Eastern context, um, uh, Moses is not trying to set up uh, a cosmology at all, or certainly a scientific approach. He's trying to communicate something different. Um, so, but Yom can be a part of the day. It can be an indefinite period of time, and it can be 24 hours. So, um, uh, but and science seems to indicate pretty clearly that the Earth is um, uh, very, very old, and so they're they're old Earthers. Well, they're both believers. They're both believers. They're trying to wrestle with the word and they're trying to wrestle with what they see versus those that say, here's what the Bible or here's what science conclusively says. Um, here's my biased reading of the Bible. Uh, this is just an old book that, you know, has deluded us and get rid of it. Well, now they, they've shown their bias, right? They've shown their bias. Um, and, and they... I will also say this, nobody, myself included, none of us come to any study, study of the Bible, the study of science, morally neutral. N none of us do, or without bias, or without presupposition. We all bring something to the table. Now, I think we can be as objective as we can, but in our study of it, we bring, I bring Dana Smith, and Dana Smith has baggage, and Dana Smith has issues. And Dana Smith can be objective, but Dana Smith can be subjective. And so I bring all of that. And I think as long as we acknowledge that, then we can have, you know, start to have good conversations. You were going to say something. Um, I'll just never forget this. Matthew had gone to this special um, lecture at Bucknell, and it was about the carbon atom. Oh, yeah. And he called, remember that? He called up, he was so excited. He said, you cannot believe the carbon atom. He said, you know, all the things it can do and how it's made up and it can fit everywhere. He said, it's just amazing God's creation. Now, I'm pretty sure the professor up there was not talking about God's creation. Right. But Matthew came out of this lecture about the carbon atom. None of us would really want to go to that, I don't think. But um, about he saw God in the car carbon atom. Right. You know, right. And, and the beauty of it. And he thought it expressed the beauty of God. And I'll give you another example in a second. I want Ken to jump in. So, so now that we're down this rabbit hole, yeah. Um, <laughs> the new set, the new uh, new telescope that we just yep. put out. Yep. Okay. Um, some of the first indications and things that they're looking at is that the Big Bang theory may be wrong. Mm. Okay. And because they see something that's called redshift, they're not seeing it further out. The further out that they look, the galaxies don't seem to be moving that way. They seem to be moving either in or not expanding at all. Mm -hmm. So, we know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right, really, right, when you think about it. 
So it's right. like, and, and it's going to be interesting to see how the, all this plays out for the people that are so entrenched in these theories. These uh, that become political theories. I I agree with you. I very much so. That's why I think <clears throat> a proper scientific understanding is this is always to use the term evolving our knowledge of things in the best sense of the term, right? We're always growing in our understanding of the universe. And someday, should the Lord tarry, we'll come up with an even better telescope. You know what I mean? Um, and we'll continue to see things that will blow our mind. We could see ourselves on the other side. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> and all the superhero multiverse thing may come to No, I don't yeah, think that's going to happen at all. Um, I, I, I will mention one resource uh, for those who are really interested uh, in, in people People cut from the Puritan mold who love to explore science and I think are fair. And it's Reasons to Believe, reasons.org. Um, these are Christians who are scientists, not Christian scientists, right? Um, Christians who are scientists. Hugh Ross is, is the, the, the main guy there. Um, I know he's a favorite of, of Rogers. Uh, we happened upon that. But, but Hugh Ross um, uh, and, and his team, um, they, they will – They'll try to stay on top of things like this, right? So my guess is he, if there isn't an article on there, there will be one already. Um, Hugh Ross will look at something like Cro-Magnon Man and say, there seems to be the fossil record that indicates that this creature existed. We know from science and from scripture that evolution is not accurate. But this thing seems to be there um, and so, what is it? And they have concluded, for now, they're willing to change, that, um, that uh, this, and I call it creature, this hominid existed and then went extinct. Much like the woolly mammoth, much like other things. Because, and, and there have been the dodo bird. There have been many creatures that have come into existence that are very similar to modern creatures, dinosaurs, that are not now here. And so they're saying there just seems to be every indication that this thing did walk the earth, it was in this area, but it's not here anymore. Um, we can only conclude that it went extinct because there is no jump from it to modern humans. And so that's um, that's going to be an approach that you may or may not agree with, but these are, they have to be, Hugh Ross is Calvinistic, and I think his team is. These are Calvinistic, um, degreed, many degreed, um, anything from physicists to biologists to geologists, etc., cetera, um, uh, who write about these things. And what they're doing, again, whether you agree with them or not, they're taking that number six. They have the love of the Bible and the love of the book of nature. And so when <clears throat> uh, I, I would simply say, and we're going to see this as we go along when you get into Puritan uh, theology, um, and especially he mentioned they wrote on hermeneutics. Did anybody know what hermeneutics is? We all have a hermeneutic, whether you know it or not. What is hermeneutics? Oh, it's uh, the interpretation of Scripture. It's the way you interpret Scripture. It, technically, the way you interpret anything. And then biblical hermeneutics is the way you interpret scripture. We all have a hermeneutic. Whether that is, oh, I just read it, what it says, that's what it is. Well, that's your hermeneutic. And it may not be the right hermeneutic. Um, or I read it, and uh, I just think it's, it's, it's very much like Aesop's fables. Um, well, that's your hermeneutic. And I'll let you know that's not the right hermeneutic. You know, But at least that's your hermeneutic. That's the way you interpret it. So if people say, well, the Bible says it, I believe that that settles it. It sounds cute, it sounds great, it sounds conservative, but it may be false. What does the Bible say? Is my question. What does it say? Well, it says this. How do you know it says that? What say? It depends on your hermeneutic and my hermeneutic. But what we're doing is we're looking, I'm going to push and say, let's look at the original language. Let's look at the original context. Let's figure out what the author was trying to say, which is why when I and pastors before me and pastors after, you know, cut that, that, that are attracted to this church and the people that you want here, we're going to try to always say, here's the context. Here's what was informing what was going on at Corinth. This is the problem Paul is addressing. 
this is what is going on. I'll give you a little more history today in the, in the story of Esther so that we can say, okay, this at least better informs my understanding so that I am, now it, it kind of makes more sense to say, oh, that's what they were going up against. That's why he used that phrase. So that's what they were talking about. Um, what we're trying to get to is authorial, the author's intent. And, um, and we also want to look at the genre of the literature. Is it poetry? Is it historical narrative? Is it apocalyptic? So that we can do our best to understand what they, what they meant. Sometimes it is face value, sometimes it's not. Sometimes a Hebrew or Greek word can have multiple definitions, a very pregnant word, and you have to say, which, which one is it, and how do I come to that conclusion? So it, it is hard, right? It is hard. But um, all of this comes from that love of learning, which is God gave us a mind for his word and for uh, the book of nature. Let's use it. Worship. Let's, let's spend a, a little bit on that. We have uh, about 10 minutes left here. <coughs> And uh, spend a few minutes on that and then get some of your questions. Um, worship, yes, it meant the corporate gathering, but it's broader than that. How did they define it? How, how do you think they defined it? What was worship to the Puritans? All of life is worship. All of life is worship. All that you do. So they would have a high view of vocation. Your vocation is uh, to be used as an act of worship. Do what you do for the glory of God, to the point where um, uh, Luther can talk about um, the operator of the guillotine. Technically, you could be a Christian and do that, he would say. Uh, do it to the glory of God. I'm like, well, how, how can you do that? Um, you know, to God's glory, I pull this cord. You know, but it, it would be the same as uh, someone giving a lethal injection you know, to use that extreme uh, example, someone, we don't have electric chair anymore, do we, in any states, or do they still yeah. exist? A few states still do it? Yeah. Um, you know, or uh, however we do it, you know, someone in a firing squad, you know, uh, pull that trigger. Luther's point, though, was um, there are certain things in Scripture you clearly can't.